Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here with us for our third and last Q&A session for the joint defense call with the topic completeness check of the application. My name is Maximilian Pschivil, and I am part of the corporate R&D and innovation support team here at Lux Innovation. So although today's presentation focuses more on the companies, there will also be a short overview of the required documentation for the research organizations. And you are, of course, all more than welcome to ask your questions that we will then discuss during the final Q&A part of this webinar. So if you have any questions, I would kindly invite you to ask them in the questions tab on your right-hand side. And finally, as a short reminder, like for the previous Q&A sessions, today's session will also be recorded and the replay can be watched directly on the platform where you can also download the presentation slides. So now you should also see the presentation slides. Um, and let's start with the first one. So on this slide, we see a short recap of the required steps until the submission of the project outline in phase one. Here, we actually need to distinguish between individual and collaborative applications. For the individual applications, the respective company or research organization would need to do the following steps. First of all, they would need to create the project on the platform and validate their participation in the project before they could then fill in the mandatory questions of the project outline and also upload all the mandatory attachments to the platform. And finally, once everything has been completed and uploaded to the platform, you can then also submit the proposal by clicking on send the project outline. The same steps actually also apply to the collaborative applications, but in addition, the respective applicants would also need to invite their collaboration partners to the project and to get at least one validation from each partner. For the final submission of the collaborative project outline, it is also necessary that each partner has uploaded all the mandatory attachments before one of them can submit a proposal for the whole consortium. So it really does not matter who of the partners submits the application, as long as it is complete and successfully submitted before the final deadline this Friday, July 29th at 11 p.m. So let's now also have a closer look at the mandatory attachments that you would need to prepare, starting with those for the research organizations. In your case, the list of attachments is rather short. So first of all, you would need to submit a CV of all the people directly involved in the project. While a narrative CV is required for the PIs, a Europass CV needs to be prepared for all the others working on the project. And please note that the phase one indications on the people can be adapted during phase two. In addition to the CVs, a legal representative of your organization would also need to sign the declaration of honor that is available in your specific uh, project space on the platform. And as a short reminder, in case you would like to submit several applications, please note that all these documents would need to be submitted for each of the projects. For further information on the eligible costs of your projects for the research organizations, I would also kindly invite you to check the FNR financial regulations by following the link on the presentation slide that, as I said before, will be available for download after this webinar. For the companies, the list of mandatory attachments is a little bit longer. As for the research organizations, your company would need to submit a Europass CV for all the people working on the project and a signed declaration of honor. But in addition, you would also need to prepare some company-specific documents. So first of all, you would need to prepare a full legal organization chart of your company and the group that it might be part of. Actually, to assess the size of your company, it is really important that this chart is complete and reflects all the linked and partner companies, as well as the ultimate beneficial owners of the company and the group. In addition, you would also need to submit the 2020 and 2021 annual accounts for both the applicant company and the group that it might be part of. 
In case you don't have consolidated accounts at group level, we would highly recommend to submit the accounts of all the linked companies. And here I would really like to also highlight the importance of the 2021 accounts to assess your company's general eligibility. So please make sure that you submit at least a draft version of these accounts if the final version should not yet be available. And finally, for all the startups, so those companies that are younger than three years, it is also mandatory to submit a business plan and a cash flow forecast with the application. For these startups, we would even recommend preparing a detailed cash flow to clearly document your, um, your assumptions and your financial viability. For all the other companies, the submission of a simplified cash flow forecast is also recommended if your project costs clearly exceed your own funds. And in any case, we would also recommend that you share any documentation that can support your financial viability and liquidity during the project realization. For additional information on these documents, so the organization chart, but also the cash flow forecast, please also have a look at the previous Q&A sessions where my colleague Eric Lauer explained them in more detail. And before going over to the most interesting part of today's webinar, the Q&A part, I would like to briefly share also some final tips and tricks that you should know before the submission. So regarding the targeted R&D milestone of the project proposal, please note that multiple selections are possible and you should actually even select all R&D milestones that apply. So from the project start to its end. And for the subcontractors that will be involved in the project, it is not necessary to, provi uh, to provide all their CVs, but they would need to fulfill nevertheless all the requirements set in the Declaration of Honor. And in general, to not miss any important news, I would also kindly invite you to regularly check the FAQ set, uh, section on the Research Industry Collaboration Platform, where you can find all additional information and help. So what next? Well, ideally, the next step should be the online submission of your project outline and the mandatory attachments before the final deadline this Friday, so before July 29th at 11 p.m. And in case you are part of a collaborative application, please also make sure that all partners agree with the final version that should get submitted and that someone of the, of the consortium submits the application before the deadline. As said before, any partner can submit for the whole consortium, but it would be necessary that all the partners have already uploaded all the mandatory attachments. So before handing now over to Alexander and uh, Richard and uh, Julia for the Q&A part, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I wish you good luck for the final preparation of the phase one application. Thank you. Thank you, Max, uh, for the details and for all the, the precisions now. I think this is a very important uh, last session for us. And uh, as we have precised already, this is really last occasion also for you to come up with your questions. Uh, we have uh, seen that there's a lot of uh, good uh, proposals in preparation. Therefore, we are very happy now to also provide you with the last information if needed. Um, yeah, just rapidly to introduce the people around us. So Julia Silvio from the Director of Defense, uh, Richard Nakat from the National Research Fund, uh, and myself also uh, from Lux Innovation. So we will now take uh, each of the questions uh, separately and then look uh, to provide the correct answer from each of us. And uh, so don't hesitate to put them in the in the chat. And we have a full hour uh, to look at all these uh, questions. So I just uh, like to start then with the first one coming from the chat from uh, Stéphane Lagrange, uh, Gradel. Um, instead of the narrative CV, is LinkedIn link sufficient? Uh, PI is a project manager of the project. Um, yes, so I think the PI can be in fact the, the project manager uh, of, of, of the, of, for the project. This is fine. For the CV, I think 
uh, the LinkedIn profile is sufficient, but uh, when it comes also to the National Research Fund, there is also the request to have a narrative a CV. Maybe Richard, you could uh, just uh, complement on that. Yes, I mean, I cannot speak for the company requirements, <clears throat> of course, but uh, speaking about the requirements for public research organizations, I have a clear no. The LinkedIn profile is never uh, enough uh, to replace the narrative CV or any other kind of CV um, for applications at the FNR, meaning that uh, we ask a so-called ORCID profile which is uh, a kind of CV for uh, online for researchers. This we ask, ask uh, as well, um, but this also does not exchange the narrative CV, but it complements it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I think just for, for, for the companies, uh, what we expect is indeed uh, the Europass format uh, so this will be sufficient for the for the collaborators uh, participating uh, from the company side. Uh, then we have a question from uh, Joamin Gonzalez. Can I delete collaborators from the application or I have to create a new project proposal? Um, so yeah, I'll just provide the first answer then maybe Julia can complement. In fact, for us in this first phase, it's really essential to already get a view on those uh, employees which will be working on the on the, on the on the project proposal and further than on if granted on the project itself uh, this is part of the first evaluation process in phase 1 and therefore you need to have a full overview if afterwards there should be some changes uh, and you need to replace somebody this can of course be done uh, with the with the necessary approval then also of the of the granting authorities but uh, yes it would be important to already have now the, the full view of the collaborators uh, Julia, you're welcome to compl compliment. Uh, yes, so I don't have much more to say about this. I, I'm just not sure if it's collaborators, like um, people working on it, or is it collaborators, other companies, uh, and so on. So that I, I'm not sure if you can elaborate uh, um, on the question, is it, do you mean collaborators, other companies working alongside you uh, on the project? that you want to remove because it's not relevant anymore or if it's really uh, people working on the project. Yeah, so Jean-Min, if you can maybe just um, go more into detail. Okay, so other companies and other colleagues that are not relevant. Yeah, I, I don't know about the technical uh, aspects on the platform. If you are able to uh, delete um, collaborators which are not relevant anymore, that I'm not sure about. Um, you, know, you will need to test, or maybe Alexander knows if you can remove uh, on your own, um, or if you need to create a, a new one. So I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for that. Okay, I would propose we will like, take that question also at, at Lux Innovation with our technical team, but uh, this, this should, uh, should be possible and without problem. Um, next question from Jamel Kadrahi from List. So yes, uh, just a question on what what needs to be uploaded in terms of CVs and declaration of honors. Yes, in fact, for companies, um, there's more to be uploaded. This is also due to the to the state aid uh, regulation and the, uh, the, the the eligibility checks that need to be done. Therefore, for companies, there's also the the balance sheet, there's the organigram uh, on on the size of the companies, and also, as mentioned by Max, the the cash flow forecasts for for startups. Our next question, is there any limitation constraints with regard to the subcontracting, if any? Uh, is the provider should be from EU, NATO, and is there any budget limits for that? So yes, this is, was in fact a question that has been uh, coming up uh, very, very often. Um, so for subcontracting, uh, they need uh, indeed uh, to, to be from a, or be based in a country uh, from NATO or from EU or from associated countries. And uh, in, in terms of um, in terms of budget limits, uh, this is, depends really on whether you are a company and you go for the MECO grant, or uh, for if you are an, a research institute and you go for the FNR grant. Um, for the MECO side, uh, th there is quite some flexibility. I think the most important is that. Um, uh, the, the the company has the necessary freedom to operate and the necessary RP rights to handle the project. Um, 
on, on budgetary side, it's as said quite flexible. And for the research side, I, I let uh, Richard uh, answer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so for the research side, it's basically limited budget-wise to 35% of the total budget asked from the FNR. And uh, other rules or our other standard rules uh, apply for subcontracting besides the already mentioned limitations concerning the headquarters or where the subcontractor comes from. And uh, that is, of course, the kind of work that is, that is to be done from the subcontractor, which is the same uh, as in our other pro uh, programs, like uh, the, the, the subcontracting done must not necessarily be the major part of the project or uh, must not be uh, or the, the, basically the applicant uh, must not be able to do it uh, him or herself. Um, so the, the standard rules still apply. Budget-wise, the limit is 35%, otherwise uh, it's standard. Okay, then we can go for the next question uh, from Simon Moser from University. So the question is about uh, hiring new people for the project. Uh, shall this be reflected in the project proposal at this stage? Uh, yes, also here yeah, we understand, of course, it's, it might not be so easy uh, now to already uh, determine all the people that, that will be working on the project. But again, this is really a very important criteria for uh, for the phase one of, the, of this call. So if you intend to recruit new people, for us it's important to already have a view on who this could be and that you already indicate really provide us uh, with the, the CVs of these people because a due diligence uh, needs to be done uh, with regard uh, to the nationalities uh, of these people and for them to be um, compliant. Um, Julia, if you want to compliment also on that point. Well, yes, as, as you said, so um, if you know we have an idea of who you want to work on the project, please share it as soon as possible so that we can have a view on that. Um, of course, if um, if in phase two you, you see other profiles coming up uh, that you didn't have uh, before that you want to, uh, to, to, to add to the project, add it to phase two. If you are selected for, um, to, to, if the project is um, selected uh, at the start of next year, um, then uh, and you have uh, people leaving and other ones coming uh, other uh, researchers you want to, to work on the project at that point please also again uh, you will need to to, to give us an update on, on uh, who is the new person uh, working on the project so it's a bit as soon as you know please let us know uh, as well um, again uh, narrative uh, cv for pi uh, Europa's uh, CV for uh, all the other ones, um, be it uh, research or companies. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, you're muted, Alexander. You're muted. Yeah, thank you, Julia. <laughs> Good point. Um, yeah, so next, next, next question in the chat, we have from Patrick Gorgan from Respectus. So where can we find the structure of the cost proposal? Uh, so this should, so the budget, the type of eligible expenses. So you, this is something you should uh, find within the, the research industry collaboration platform. Um, then for the, the eligibility of the expenses is something we addressed also within the, the webinars before. These are, it's based on the RDI law and, on, and more specifically the R&D aid schemes for the Ministry of the Economy. Uh, Max, if you want just to compliment on that. Uh... Yes, thank you, Alexander. So indeed, um, the eligible costs are, for instance, the staff costs directly related to the project realization, but also um, other external costs called special costs in the, in the platform. Uh, but also investments that you need to, to do for the project, software materials that you need to realize the project. So indeed for more specific information, I would also refer back to the first Q&A session where the eligible costs have been explained in more detail, but in a nutshell, that would be it. Okay, thank you, Max. Then we have another question from Stéphane Lagrange. Again, I think on the on the curriculum vitae. So 
I think the answer is quite simple. So if, if it's for the companies, it should be the, the Europass CV. And then if it's a research uh, organization, uh, you need also to, to go for the, the ORCID, ORCID link or and, and the narrative CV. Then we have another question of uh, list again, Jamel. Uh, is it mandatory to insert, upload all CVs of the foreseen researchers or only the PI is sufficient? And what if you plan to recruit postdocs uh, engineers uh, for some of the talks. So I think we addressed the, the point before. Um, so yes, we need to have a maximum uh, of view on the people that will be uh, implicated in the project. And as uh, said by Julien before, so if changes are upcoming uh, in, in phase two, uh, we will of course be able to consider them, but it's now already important to have the full view. The next question of Daniel Thierry about the budget information, which is the flexibility to adapt, modify it from step one to step two? Yes, uh, good question. Uh, I think here we are um, also, uh, we should try to be as close as possible to, to the final uh, bu budget uh, uh, for the project. In fact, it's an estimation nevertheless, uh, as we are in phase one and there's already an evaluation happening happening with regards to the companies uh, on their eligibility and also the co-funding capacity. Uh, we need to exactly know what uh, what will be the budget and how much you will be able to co-fund. And then uh, as this will be an important evaluation criteria, uh, you should be as close as possibly. Of course, once we go to the second step and do the working packages and more into details, there might still be some shifts, but um, looking at the overall uh, budget availability, I think also it's important to be as close as possible. Then we have next question of uh, Hubert Moser. Is an IP transfer from a non-EU, EA, EFTA, non-NS, non-NATO uh, country to Luxembourg an exclusion uh, criterion? Uh, I, I would uh, ask uh, maybe Julia to, to take this question. Uh, yes, so I, I, I wouldn't say it's an exclusion criteria. Um, so, yeah. For me, if it's just IP transfer, it's not, um, uh, yeah, some external uh, non-EU, EEA, EFTA, uh, NATO country actively working on it, for me, that then it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah, and maybe just to complement, nevertheless, uh, you need, of course, to have the, the, the IP rights, or at least the, the freedom to operate. And, uh, and also looking forward uh, to, to potential exploitation in the future, you need to be able uh, to, to, to exploit the IP that, that will have been transferred from, from these countries. Uh, next question from Jamila Wada from SNT. Uh, can researchers uh, from research organizations who are not NATO nationals work on parts of the project? Yeah, so this unfortunately is not uh, the case. So this is also a question that came up many times uh, in the last weeks. So what we can say is that if, if you have if you have um, employees within your ranks which have a double nationality from uh, a NATO country or, or an EU country, this is fine. Uh, if also um, you should be in the process of currently getting one of these nationalities and you can document uh, that you have you are in the in the process and you have a document from the, the concerned authorities, then this is something which could also be accepted. But if you have um, employees with non-NATO uh, nationalities, this will, this will unfortunately not work uh, for, for this year's call. So it's uh, NATO, uh, EA, EFTA countries, so not, not only NATO, um, so it's a bit larger than that. Yes. Okay, then next question from Ion Torcano. Is it possible to submit in phase one uh, as individual project and then add uh, potential partners in phase two? So in principle, this is uh, not possible. We, in, in the phase one, uh, each of the projects will be evaluated independently on whether it's an individual or collaborative project. So there's other assessment criteria in phase one. Uh, nevertheless, if uh, we see uh, that some of the topics and some of the projects uh, are retained for phase two and they are either actually on the same topic. So there might be a recommendation to potentially uh, make a fusion 
of projects. But uh, it is not foreseen that um, um, at this stage, an invent project can directly be converted into uh, a collaborative one uh, because there's already a first assessment at, uh, in phase one. Then we have next question from uh, Jamel Kadri from LIST. Is there any limit on the budget related to material acquisition for test bed set up for the public uh, institutes? Uh, Richard, can you take that one? Um, basically, our standard rules apply again, um, which you can find in the financial guidelines. There is no maximum, um, but if you want to purchase equipment, uh, in this call, we set a limit to 25,000, above which uh, we only um, basically cover the costs of the equipment that is actually being used in the project. Yeah, So we only um, cover the depreciation costs during the project and only for the extent to which the equipment was used during the time of the project for this particular purpose. Okay, thank you, Richard. Then the next question of Max Zales of Hydrosat. Only startups younger than three years of age need to hand in a business plan, even if the company is considered an SME. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, so if you have three, three years less of age, uh, then um, you need to prepare a business plan. This is part of the of the Ministry of Economy procedures to to get stay dates and in for R and D, and so this goes with the business plan and also with the cash flow forecast. Um, then we have a question from Catherine Lollier. Do we need to add the CVs of the foreseen researchers for the non-contracting partners? Um, the non-contracting partners need to submit a declaration of, of honor. Um, so I believe this is also a formulation with the non-contracting partners mostly used within the FNR. So Richard, if you can also take that one, that would be great. So um, basically, as we handle it usually with non-contracting partners, uh, at least the uh, PI from the non-contracting side or the main contact from the non-contracting side needs to provide a CV. Um, concerning uh, the, the, the full team, that is something that we from FNR side uh, could handle um, like with the subcontracting. We would need, don't need to have the full team list, uh, but the, we would hold basically the contracting partner accountable uh, that the non-contracting partner upholds the uh, declaration of honor, of honor that, is, uh, that it extends to them. I hope that uh, okay. answers the question. Otherwise, I uh, would need to ask Julia to compliment on that uh, if this is not sufficient. Okay, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, then we have a next question of Christophe Antoine. Do you have an example of a declaration of honor or what to write on declaration of honor? So this, uh, indeed, there is a template and this should also be available on, on the research industry collaboration platform. So um, you need to check if you have created your account and you have also access to the to the project. It might be also in collaboration then with, with a research institute then going through the slides, you will get an, a, a direct uh, a link to the template. Uh, Max, could you confirm that, please? Yes, indeed. Um, so once you um, once you um, are in the mandatory attachment section in the project space, there you will find all the templates that are available. So be it uh, for the declaration of honor, for the research organizations and companies, but also for the cash flow forecasts, for instance, for the companies. Okay. Uh, there was another question, Alexander, that you missed from uh, Martin Schlerf. Yes. Um, going on. Ah, yes. So one question here from Martin Schlerf. I plan to hire a PhD student. Who this will be is presently unknown. Is it sufficient to say that the person to be hired will have NATO nationality? Yes. So we understand this is difficult, um, but what we would uh, propose in this case is to to still indicate uh, the person that you would probably hire. If there's already a list of candidates of PhDs, then to choose the one that will be most probably recruited. 
uh, as said before, this is part of the due diligence process we need to do in phase one. Uh, if later on there, there will be a change and it's not going to be the candidate uh, that you indicate in phase one, this is not an issue, uh, then we will have to see uh, if it can be replaced and of course uh, uh, with approval then uh, by the granting authorities. Yeah, maybe I can uh, add something on that because this is perhaps a, a, a bigger issue for the um, public research organizations and of course for the companies because they regularly hire uh, basically unknown personnel uh, or per basically personnel that is unknown at the start of the project or at least at the submission uh, stage. And um, usually it is that uh, there is no dedicated request or validation of the personnel necessary in our other programs. But uh, you should uh, be aware that when we draft the co when the contract is drafted between us and the public research organizations, that it will not be possible to just hire uh, personnel that is not validated by the FNR and to that, to that extent um, the uh, Ministry of the Exterior and Department of Defense. Um, that means every personnel that is going to be paid from the FNR grant uh, will need to be validated first. So if you hire and uh, then we will just make a check uh, according to the guidelines of this uh, program. So it will not be possible to just hire them. And in the end, um, uh, everything will be paid. So we will need to make a check before that. But it will be uh, no problem as long as you just uphold the uh, obligations from the Declaration of Honor, but still uh, there will be one check in between. Yeah, thank you for this uh, additional information, Richard. Uh, I hope this clarifies uh, the question. So uh, the next point comes from uh, Sedat Kara from Hightak. So is there any limitation on test costs? Um, in fact, you need to conduct tests with users and users' representatives to validate your work. Lab tests are not enough to validate hypotheses. So yes, I think this is something where Max can probably also go more in details, but uh, with the R&D aid schemes, which are possible within the course of its experimental development and industrial research, uh, these tests are of course necessary and also eligible. So this goes, um, uh, this can go quite, quite far also in terms of testing and also in, 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 in the environment. Maybe Max, you can just uh, complement on that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alexander. So indeed, I can also confirm this information and there's no specific percentage that would be eligible um, or a certain limitation for the respective costs. It's really on a case by case basis that the Ministry of the Economy will uh, analyze your project and your budget afterwards. Thank you. So the next question comes from Amina and I regarding budget. Shall we indicate the eligible costs, total costs plus 25% of overheads, or the finance costs? With uh, so the 500k without a partner or the maximum 700k with a partner. Uh, yes, I think well you should of course then indicate the the, the eligible costs. Um, so I think the, the, the 500K and the 700K are the, the maximum uh, that you can get in terms of grants. The 500K uh, would be, uh, I, so I imagine you're from a, from a research institute. This is 500K in case of a, an individual uh, project, 700K with a partner, but this is just uh, the grant. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe Richard, you can compliment on that. Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? So the question is uh, regarding the budget, shall we indicate the eligible costs or the finance costs? So the finance costs would be the 500K without a partner or the 700K with a partner, while the eligible costs would only be the total costs plus the 25% of overheads on direct costs. Maybe I have a uh, problem now, but I don't really understand what is meant. <laughs> Sorry. I think the yeah, probably for, for, for logic uh, response, so you would of course need to just provide a view on the eligible costs. Now the funding can in theory go up to 500K or to 700K depending on the, on the structure of your, your consortium. But if it's uh, lower, 
then of course the the, the 100 covering uh, funding by the fnr uh, might also be lower but if it's not clear we i i would just suggest maybe to to uh, rewrite the question and we can take it uh, later on a next question from hubert moza so referring to ip transfer and dedication of honor could you explain the provision uh, the intellectual property used in the frame of the R&D project is originating from a NATO member country or from a EU EA EFTA country. Yes, so in fact, I think this is um, in the declaration of honor, uh, and this is very important uh, in the sense that if you are using IP uh, from a partner or uh, within the project or from a, a non-binding contractor, then it needs to be sure that this IP comes uh, is still within uh, the NATO member countries or within uh, EU, EEA, EFTA. And I think uh, also that to, to make the connection with the previous question, because it was a question of IP transfer. So the IP can be transferred uh, from another country, but in the end, during the project, whatever ip will be used must be present within the company or research institute which is belonging to a nato member uh, country i hope this makes it more clear next question from jamila uh, from snt so does fnr encourage to have phd students on this project if yes then we would expect that scientific publications will also be encouraged right uh, Richard, I'll, I'll give you that question. <laughs> uh, we do not encourage or discourage uh, here anything. Uh, they can hire PhD students on the project, uh, but should note that uh, the fourth year is not covered by the FNR. Uh, and so for this call, we do not explicitly encourage or discourage it more or less than in other uh, programs. Okay, thank you, Richard. Next question from uh, Vadim Veshezerov. So can non-EU citizens living permanently on EU country participate in the team of the project? So more exactly, can Russian citizens living in the EU participate? My question would be no, but I would also there just uh, let Julia provide the answer. Uh, no, no, uh, that's not, that not be possible for, for projects. Okay, thank you, Julien. So next question from a uh, list uh, from Jamel Kadraoui. Is there any recommendation, recommendation about the project duration or is this depending on the project plans? Yes, I think this is completely depending on the, on the project plans. Uh, we have put a limitation in terms of duration up to 36 months uh, with a possibility and this is really on the on the on the standard process of FNR and and Meko to have an extension if required. Um, but uh, here I think you can as well have a project that is just taking twelve months, and it really depends on which uh, on which level which level of maturity you eventually you are going to target. So if you are just going to target an an a, um, a feasibility study, uh, this might possibly just be a project over twelve months uh, and not more. Uh, next question from Jamila. When is the earliest possible start and the latest possible start of uh, the project? Yes, uh, I'll provide the answer there and then also uh, let Max uh, compliment. So for the earliest possible start, we have set uh, the beginning of March with the uh, results also of the of the phase two being expected uh, uh, in, in, in February. Therefore, this is, comes more, um, it's more about an eligibility criteria and, and the incentive effect. So we need indeed to, to wait uh, uh, to get the approval and then to start. Otherwise, the, the costs might not be eligible. But I will, uh, I will, I will let Max uh, compliment on it. Uh, thank you, Alexander. In fact, I guess you already mentioned um, everything. So. Um... It's indeed to respect the incentive effect, you would need to uh, wait to wait for the final signature of the aid convention with the granting authorities before you should start the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then indeed for the latest possible start, I think, um, yeah, this is also then upon uh, negotiation also of the, of the funding contract, but it should indeed start as early as possible after the uh, the re uh, after the communication of results and the signature of the funding agreement. 
Okay, so we have another, yeah, uh, uh, let's say, an, a correction or further information on the question that we had before uh, about the eligible costs um, uh, on um, on research institutes. So there's an example, uh, for example, without a partner, if my eligible costs reach 526k, should I indicate 526k split by the categories, or should I split my costs by categories to reach a maximum? 500k to be in accordance with FNR grant rules. Richard, could you take that question, please? I'm searching for the for the example that you just mentioned. Okay, right and bunch of indicated costs. Okay, so uh, basically the question, as I understand it, is um, okay. It's really just the, the total cost, or just the cost that could be funded by by the uh, FNR. Um, here, um, to be in line uh, with the uh, the company side, because uh, here you get the total costs. Or the, to be just the, to be funded costs. Uh, how is it with the companies? Because I had this question, I think uh, once before, and um, since we split it in in the phase two, where this is more clearly um, in phase one, uh, to be a, to have a better comparability, uh, I aligned with the the rules for the companies, which was the total costs. Is that correct? Um, actually, for the companies. It would be uh, sufficient to indicate the eligible costs. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in-kind contributions would not be uh, considered in for the, in the case of the companies. Mm -hmm. um, so, what the company should indicate is really the eligible budget of the project, and afterwards, based on the size of the company, on the technical complexity of the project, the Ministry of the Economy will calculate the exact aid amount. Yeah, but uh, this is basically they indicate the amount uh, above what the actual aid from Meko will be, um, and so here it will be the same. So please indicate your total costs, including overheads, even if it exceeds the maximum five hundred or the maximum seven hundred uh, k. Okay, thank you. I think this this made uh, the the, the yeah. question now clear. <laughs> Um, so we'll take the next question of Jamel uh, Kadwai about the reviewers who will be looking and assessing the projects. Are they expert from the private or public uh, and from Luxembourg only? So for the phase one, uh, the reviewers will be the granting authorities. Uh, um, as said also in the call text, they will go through uh, the different projects which are submitted. Um, and then in phase two, in fact, uh, it goes through the, an independent evaluation panel and uh, which will be, uh, and this will be managed also by the FNR. So Richard, you uh, can possibly provide further information. Yeah, um, there will be an expert panel and uh, this will be perhaps uh, filled since we're having a, a broader application uh, base here for the, uh, for the thematics that are coming in. So uh, they will not be necessarily particular ex uh, experts in every detailed field. Yeah, they will be uh, coming from uh, with experience from both academic and the uh, and the private side, um, but they will be experts in the domains, but perhaps not in the necessarily particular uh, application space that you target. Thank you. And I think this is also something um, which we will go on uh, more into detail uh, for phase two. So upon validation and with the start of phase two, there will also be again a webinar. We will more uh, deeply uh, explain how the evaluation phase will go. I think, um, as you know, also from the call text, then there will be in phase two, uh, besides the independent evaluation process with a ranking list, 
uh, then also a further uh, evaluation by the State Commission at the Ministry of Economy for those projects which have uh, also a company. So. Okay, I think this brings us to the uh, last uh, set of questions. Uh, so uh, first from, from Simon Moser, so personal from the same company, RTO, having a registered, having registered with slightly different company, RTO names, currently have different views in the joint portal. Is there a possibility to fix this? Yes, I, I, I think there definitely is. Um, so I, we, are, we, are, we are aware of these issues and we are uh, currently working on them. Uh, Max, if you want to compliment on that. Um, yes, in case you face such a technical difficulty, I would really invite you to um, contact um, us via the contact form on the platform so that our IT colleagues can uh, fix these issues. Thank you, Max. Then we have an, another question of Hussein uh, Demirci. Is there a template, a restriction for project description? So here again, this is uh, all the templates are actually online. So on the on the platform. So if you have a, a partner which has possibly created the projects and you're in collaboration, uh, just make sure also then to also get access. You need to create an account, and uh, when you have and you're associated to, to the project, then you can directly then uh, write all the information in the different tabs uh, of the of the project description. If there still are, if it's not working, don't hesitate to to write also an email to contact at futuresindustry.lu. Uh, then, uh, yes, if you want to compliment, Richard or? Uh, no, but uh, just at the end, I want to just uh, compliment on something concerning the new hirings uh, and my comment I had earlier, just to perhaps uh, make it more clearly before I get flooded with questions after. <laughs> OK, you, you, you want to take it now or at the end? Uh, as I wish, I can just perhaps comment on it now. Um, so okay. my addition to this comment uh, it concerns the new hiring. So if you plan for a public research organization to hire a new PhD, a new postdoc, or whatever new uh, uh, personnel that is necessary for the project, and it, it is marked uh, then in phase two as an N, which is uh, quite common for, for our usual research programs, um, then usually you hire this person and only in the next annual report uh, we will then uh, basically see who you hired uh, and the costs will be eligible for that and uh, only afterwards we uh, see if everything is okay um, what perhaps uh, is will be the case here in this program is that we have, uh, that we will look closer on this new hiring and will reserve the right of course uh, to reject uh, the hiring on the basis of the rules we have uh, according to the Declaration of Honor, meaning that you, by any accident, hire a person that uh, that has a, uh, if you don't know, for example, that uh, uh, that ha has a uh, nationality out outside of the uh, NATO EU countries, then we reserve the right, of course, uh, to reject that person. And we want to see a CV uh, from that person, which is usually then not the case um, in our regular funding programs. There we just get then uh, the, the postdoc in the annual report with a name and uh, how many person months worked on that uh, and so forth. But here we will reserve the right to get, of course, for this new hiring, the proof that this person uh, basically is eligible to this particular program. That does not mean that we want to be included in the hiring process or that we need, to, or that you need our approval to hire that person. But we reserve the right, of course, um, in the end to say, no, this person cannot work on a project or then the, the whole project uh, might be ineligible af afterwards. And uh, this right, this veto right extends, of course, also to the ministry. Yeah, that that is just the case, but this only counts uh, for the fact of the nationality aspect uh, about the security uh, of the, of this program and no other uh, constraints. Uh, so we do not evaluate then the uh, we do not evaluate the the, the, the uh, appropriateness of the scientific background of that person. That is up to you, and uh, uh, but we will evaluate the, the the person based on the CV, and you will need to. Uh, provide a CV as if this person would have been already known before project start at the submission stage. 
that's only what I want to say. And I hope that is clear. Otherwise, I will give me, get flooded with questions. <laughs> Okay, for me it was clear, and uh, I hope it was also the case for the for the listeners. So we'll um, take just very quickly, Alexander, because uh, there was a follow-up on uh, Richard's comment. So, are holders of double, triple citizenships eligible if one citizenship is made to comply? Uh, that is a yes. Uh, we said that, uh, or even if you are in application of a double or triple citizenship, um, as long as you have proof of official. Uh, demand uh, that the document is being treated as well. Yes, thank you for that. Um, yeah, there are still other questions also in the questions tab, so I'll take those two. So there's a question from uh, Johannes Lauris. Is there a minimum TRL desired? Um, yes, yes and no, because in the end, yes, we have TRL 1 to 6, so it's really the lowest possible TRL up to 6. Uh, this is um basically for for the companies it's about industrial research and experimental development and uh, for for the others or those who are also uh, used to to european projects or more specifically the european defense fund it's uh, about um, technology maturity levels up to system prototyping uh, starting from generating knowledge so next question from uh, jamila can researchers who are not nato nationals work on part of the projects. Uh, yes, there again, this is not possible. Um, now, and I refer also to what Richard said, we have this declaration of honor. Uh, it's of course, um, you, you sign this declaration by saying that uh, whoever you will be collaborating with or working with in the project uh, will be uh, will be uh, somebody from a NATO country, EU country, and of course also uh, these the people who would be employed on that should be working on that, but we are not going to ask you to provide any uh, any um, evidence for that. By signing declaration of honor, uh, we expect that this, this that this will be the case. Okay, then we have a question from Chloe Kretz from uh, Real Luxembourg. Can a non luxembourg research organization be part of the consortium? Is it possible to consider it as a subcontractor of an applicant company? In this case, would the research organization be funded by FNR or by the Ministry of Economy? So Lux Innovation does not provide any funding. So the, the granting of 40 is either the uh, National Research Fund, FNR, or the Ministry of the Economy. Um, yes, in our case, only uh, if, if you plan to be part of the consortium, you need to be uh, uh, you need to be a Luxembourg entity, research institute, or company. But there is a possibility for uh, non luxembourg entities to be part uh, as a as a subcontractor or also as said uh, before for under fnr rules uh, as a non-binding contractor so these are our two possibilities then we have a question from simon moser if personnel needs to be hired for this project shall we reflect this on in the proposal uh, at this stage Yes, uh, definitely, and we should already get uh, as as close as possible information uh, with a, with a CV. Yes. Then the next question from Ion Turcano: Is it possible to submit in phase one as individual project and then add a potential project partner? I think we answered that question already before. Uh, so no, it's not planned um, to to make any changes afterwards. Uh, both individual and collaborative projects are eligible and will be assessed as such in phase one. Then we have a question of Maria Rita Palatella. What is expected in the section? What are the intended research or development activities of the applicant? And how is it different from the section? What are the expected technical contribution of each partners? So I think uh, the first question about uh, what are the intended research and development activities is really about explaining what will be the different uh, development steps and research steps of your projects. We need to understand uh, which research is to be done, uh, which efforts are, are to be taken into this project. But, uh, and this is where the second uh, question is also referring, we need also to understand what you have actually in, 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 in house of competences and which competence you will need to get from the other partners. And therefore, 
if you are in a collaboration or if you are uh, depending also on subcontractors, it will be essential to uh, clearly indicate what will be their input. And this will eventually also help to understand what is actually being done within within the company and this because this is going to be the main eligible costs but also the costs of the subcontractors and other uh, partners need to be understood so then we have another question uh, about the startups younger than three years i think we took that question already um then we have another question about the ip transfer from non-eu countries and non-NATO countries, we also had that question before. And then we have, I think, a question which we did not take yet from uh, from Simon Moser. Can we remove personal information in the Europass, for example, a place or date of birth? Well, I, I would guess this is not possible, but uh, Julia also with regards to requirements of the of the defense yes no no so for me um that yeah you you don't need to, to put that in um if it's but i i don't remember i have done the europe a long time ago so i don't remember if it's mandatory uh, to, to fill out or not but from for us it, it's very it's personal information i don't believe um that i need that we need to have that, that level of uh, of detail. Um, so for me, that it's fine. We have nationalities and so on. That's what uh, is interesting. Um, you never choose where you are being born. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Julia. So I think this leaves us with two questions. Uh, so another one from Maria Rita Palatella, and a very important one indeed. What is the exact time of the deadline on Friday, 29th? So uh, unless wrong, this is 11 o'clock uh, in the evening. Uh, Max, could you confirm that, please? Yes, that's correct. The deadline is this Friday, 29th of July at 11 p.m. OK, so we, we recommend, of course, not to submit on the last day, but to make it possibly already until Thursday. But we will, of course, also be the platform will be fully operational uh, the whole Friday uh, until 11 o'clock. And then a last question from Cécile Petit for a proposal with a research organization. I have a PI and a co-PI from the same institution. Can we submit a narrative CV for both PIs and co-PIs? So I'm not sure if, if it is needed, but maybe Richard, you can answer that. So, uh, sorry, could you repeat the question? So in this case, the, the research organization has a PI and a co-PI uh, mm -hmm. from the same institution and mm -hmm. uh, they ask if they can submit a narrative cv for both pis for both pi and co pi yeah that's possible okay great and i think we are nearly through there's just maybe another question yeah which came up here from martin schlerf so should references be added to the respective sections and add to the maximum number of characters um yeah, if you could maybe just specify what you what you mean by by references maybe i can perhaps guess um uh, no, normally references are of course uh, if you have a bibliography uh and uh basically but we in the phase one at least from the fnr side we don't do a, a plagiarism check so uh, you do not need to point out any reference you do not have to have any bibliography i don't know if that is meant by the question but uh, that is not necessary to put it in there already only for phase two okay thank you indeed i think the so it was uh, the, we got an additional precision so yes in fact it wasn't in reference to literature so it's not required now at, at, at this stage um just going back maybe to the other questions There's one about uh, the, uh, the question that I addressed for the public research organizations, but uh, also is this applicable to companies from Sedat Kara? Mm. I'm just looking for that. Could you possibly uh, repeat uh, it? 
Yeah, we are talking a lot about people hired for research institutes. There is personnel turnover within companies. Our personnel changes, uh, new hirings for company should be validated by you, question mark. So I'll take that question. So um, we are not validating the personnel uh, changes or hires. What we are doing is uh, validating the new personnel specifically working on the project. So you can hire whoever you want to replace, whoever you want. Um, it's just if the, there is a new person uh, being uh, introduced to the project, we would need um, uh, the same as we had for other personnel, um, your plus CV uh, with uh, Necessary information, uh, so no other questions. So no personal information as such, but the nationality, uh, no date of birth or place of birth, it doesn't matter, but uh, yeah, so same level of class. Yeah, and I think it's also here important that once you get the funding agreement and there should be any change uh, within the team and you need to possibly replace somebody, this is of course, uh, there, there will of course be a, a validation required um, by the granting authorities. Okay, so just got another question. Oh, it's just a thanks. So yeah, you're welcome to that. Um, do you see any other questions? Because at the moment we have questions in the question uh, chat and in the chat box too. So I don't see any other questions unless uh, you do. So if it's not the case, um, yeah, I would uh, like to thank all the all the speakers. And uh, I think, yes, if you have any other questions still up to come, there's of course still a few days left. Uh, we are available for, for any further information. And uh, I wish you all good luck now for the first uh, next steps and uh, all the best and for the, for the submission. Uh, see you soon and good luck again. Bye-bye.